Excellent. So you should see the planet. Um, I like to tell my students that I took this on one of my field trips, but not many of them believe me, but it would have been nice. So this is essentially the system that we're dealing with, the atmosphere, the land, the sea, and of course, the one thing that you can't see, which is the sun. And they're all connected. And I'll be talking a little bit about that connection tonight because they're all tying together. And we're messing with the system, as you know, and this is going to cause some of the problems we've got. So in fact, there was a title there. There it is. Climate change, the science, the impacts, and the effects on the natural environment, agriculture, and water. <clears throat> so the big question, and, and maybe there are some skeptics out there. I've given many, many talks, and there's always a few people who are a little bit cautious, and that's fine. One should be cautious. One should always question, and one should ask, listen, are we really burning up? Or is this just a false alarm? It's just a natural cycle. And alles sal rechkom, which is Afrikaans for everything's going to be okay. So let's just look at something that's been on the news very, very recently. And this came out in July 18. If I'm correct, in July 18 was on Monday this week. Britain was on course for its hottest day on record. Ever. Now, on record means since they were recording temperatures. And in England, they've been recording temperatures for a very, very long time. If not with thermometers, then at least with written recordings on things that have happened um, and, and days that have been extremely uncomfortable. So they reckon it's hit 40, they were gonna hit 40 degrees for the first time. And if you can see the my mouse, I don't know if you can, let me just do this. Okay, if you can see my mouse, you can see that actually what they did report on Tuesday the 19th was 40.2 degrees Celsius. Now, I spoke to some farmers today um, up in the Swartland um, in Mariesburg and, and from Picketburg, and they were telling me, no, but they laugh at 40 degrees, you see, because 40 degrees is nothing. I mean, it often happens in summer. But if you're in London at a latitude of 60 degrees, then 40 degrees is really, really abnormal. And this is what we call an extreme temperature. And the extreme temperatures are something that you don't really want. The funny thing is, funny you should say that, is we're seeing a lot of climate anomalies and extreme events around the world. Now, this is from last year. We haven't updated this this year, but now what we've got this year is massive heat waves in Europe, fires. We've avoided the fires in Australia, but we've had floods. Africa has been relatively quiet this year, and the United States is experiencing one of their hottest summers. So we're seeing these extreme events. We're seeing climate anomalies coming. But maybe it's just because we notice them more. Maybe it isn't anything that's changing. Maybe it's just something that's always been there, but we notice it more now, and maybe it affects more people because there are more people. So we need to have a look at it very, very carefully. Global surface temperature was the highest for July since records began. Ooh, hello. Well, that's a warning. That's something that we weren't expecting. So let's get some background facts. There's a very short distance between fact and fake, and we need to be sure that we understand what the facts are. So firstly, <clears throat> if you live in South Africa, you probably know this, but just to put the record straight, if we're talking about climate change, we need to know what our current climate is. So South Africa is an interesting country because we've actually got five rainfall regions, we like to describe them. And so if we look at them very, very carefully, you get the summer rainfall region, you get the winter rainfall region, you get the rain throughout the region, you get the arid regions, and then you get the bogor all rainfall regions, which we call the very dry regions. And these exist, okay? They exist, they historically been described, we've got long-term averages and measurements for them. So if we're talking about climate change, we must be very careful, we're talking about change from what into what. So it's important for us to understand what our current climate is. So here's an average South African city. Yeah, it used to be called Varambat, the name has changed now, but these are the records from very, very far ago. And it's in, if I'm, I stand corrected, but I think it's in the Limpopo. It might be on the border between Gauteng and Limpopo, and I stand corrected there exactly where it is. But this is what the scenario is like in, in Varambat. And you look at the blue and that's rainfall, and you look at the red is maximum temperature and the green is minimum temperature. So you can see the rainfall falls in summer, which for those of us in the Western Cape is, hang on, is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's summer rainfall, we're winter rainfall. So that's right. Rainfall falls in summer and mostly between 
October and March. The rest of the year doesn't get very much. So that's the situation now. Then the temperatures, clearly hotter in summer, cooler in winter. In summer, the average maximum is around 30. In winter, the average maximum is around 4. Average minimum, sorry, I beg your pardon. The average minimum is around 4 degrees. So that's pretty much if you go to July and you say, well, what's happening in July? In that area, you'll see the rainfall is minimal. The minimum temperature is around about 3 or 4 degrees. And the maximum temperature is maybe 20, 21, 22. So this is the climate as we know it. That's how it is. That's the deal. And if we look at this map, the satellite picture of Southern Africa, I'd like you to think in your head quickly, which season is this? Which season does this represent? So you must ask, what am I looking at? And you're looking at a satellite photograph with false color, but trying to indicate to us the greenness of the vegetation. So if you look at this very carefully, a scientist would want you to do, and you ask questions and you say, why is it green in some parts and dry in some parts? Well, clearly it's because it's raining in the parts that are green. So this would be where it is raining in the eastern parts of the country, which is the summer rainfall region. So you quickly deduce this is summer. And then you say, well, then it must be dry in the Western Cape. And you go to the Western Cape and there you go. It's dry. And there are all sorts of little red spots there which indicate fires, but I'm not going to talk about that now. Then, <clears throat> six months later, the satellite picture looks like this. Two things to notice. Firstly, there are very few clouds over the interior. And that's because it's the dry season. The dry season over the interior is winter. But the Western Cape then says, what? Dry season? It's got to be wet here. Otherwise, we don't get any rain whatsoever. And you'll see that it's green in the Western Cape. So we understand the, the differences across the country. And we could, can explain them. If you went to geography at school, you recognize the synoptic chart. And you'll see by the date that this is February. Therefore, summer, low pressure, unstable over the inland. Unstable, low pressure leads to rainfall. Summer rainfall. High pressure is stable, is circulating anti-clockwise around the high pressure system. Western Cape is getting dry, stable air, easterly, southeasterly winds. That's the st summer status. We understand that. We know that. We can explain it. We know why it is like this. And this is important for us to realize that. The winter situation is different. Winter situation is the high pressure is now moving in to dominate the interior. High pressure, dry, stable. Air is rotating anti-clockwise around the high pressure cell. So you're getting easterly winds coming around very, very dry, very, very cold, but very, very dry. Meanwhile, in the south, if we're lucky, and if this high pressure cell gives way, the frontal systems over here, which are unstable, based around the low pressure, bringing the rainfall to the Western Cape. When is this? Winter in this one particular one is in August and rainfall coming to the Western Cape. So we understand this. So basically what we've done is we've done a quick revision of South Africa's climate. Now, many people will tell you that we have a dry climate, very dry climate. So let's look at the facts. You'll see three cities there. <clears throat> you might not recognize the first one on the top left because that building isn't there anymore. It's an old photograph, but never mind. You'll recognize the Empire State Building. So I've given it away and I can't hear you, but I'm sure you're thinking out loud and you're saying, that's New York. That's New York. Excellent. This looks like Cape Town. But actually, I'm going to talk about the average South African city. And Cape Town has, if you take the, the six or seven big cities in South Africa, Cape Town has pretty much got an average rainfall out of those cities. This one, you'll recognize the Big Ben clock or the Big Ben. There's the bell inside there, the, the parliamentary buildings, a nice red bus. And you'll say, great, you know this. This is London. My question to you now, which one of these cities has the highest annual rainfall in the center, as measured in the center of the city? The average South African city, New York, or London? I'm going to let you think about it. I'm asking you to put your hands up, but of course I can't see you, so that's not going to work. But I'm pretty sure that many of you would go for, go for, go for, go for, go for London. Look, it's raining already in London. And then, well, you're not too sure. Let's check at the facts. New York has an average of 1260 millimeters. Average South African cities between 620 and 830. Cape Town's about 820 in the center of the city. And London, no, can't be. That can't be right. There must be a mistake here. London can't be 583 because that's less than the other two cities. So while you're sitting there quickly, I know that some of you are quickly going on to Google. But I'll save you the trouble. Because if you go to Google, you'll see that London has 583.6 millimeters. Now, that's funny. That's a little odd. 
That doesn't sound right. We know that everyone tells us London is rainy. Look at the picture there. It's got people with umbrellas. You don't go to London without an umbrella. The truth is, the facts are that the rainfall intensity is very low. The number of rain days is very high, but the average amount of rainfall per day is very low. 106 rainy days in London each year. How many does Cape Town get? Around about 35. That's less than a third of London. So why do we say we're in a dry country? Well, the answer is that our rainfall mostly falls in summer. And summer is hot and that rain evaporates. And that isn't good because it means the water disappears very soon after it's hit the ground. Cape Town's a little different. We get our rainfall in winter, and that's very nice. But when is our growing season for our crops? Well, wheat's in winter, but the fruit and the wine, which makes more money for our economy than anything else, needs that water in summer when it doesn't rain. So we've got to be very careful of the implications of climate change on various places in the world. So now comes the question, right, let me tell me more. What's this global warming thing and what's the difference between global warming and climate change? So these are the sort of questions that your wife, your husband, your daughter, your uncle, your aunt, your grandmother and your auntie are going to ask you. Is it real? And they're going to ask you after this presentation because you're going to tell them I went to this presentation. I know everything about it. How do we know it's real? Has it already started? What's going to happen? Can we stop it? And what about essential things like food and water? Hmm. So let's try and answer these questions. We first have to understand <clears throat> what is the deal with carbon dioxide? Now, normally I'd ask you to put your hand up if you did biology at school, and many of you would, and I'd ask you to explain to me what the carbon cycle is. But essentially, it's the circulation of carbon in our atmosphere or on our planet. And we're kind of limited to the surface to the top of the atmosphere. And you can see the arrows there showing how carbon circulates around the atmosphere. So what's the deal about carbon? Well, carbon is life. We talk about carbon life forms. That's what we are. We eat carbon. We don't breathe carbon, but we breathe out carbon. And carbon is an essential element in terms of our life on Earth. And you'll see that there's some arrows that go up and down, and there's some arrows that just go down, and some arrows that just go up. And the biggest arrow that just goes up is on the right-hand side, which is fossil fuel combustion and cement manufacture. Now, that ain't natural. That is something that is human-induced. And there's another one there which says land use changes. Now, land use changes could be natural. A whole area could be destroyed by fire. That's possible. But generally speaking, these are also human-induced. So you can see the two human comp components here are leading to more carbon going into the atmosphere. What's the deal with carbon and carbon dioxide? Well, carbon reacts with oxygen to form carbon dioxide and heat. And heat is why we burn these fossil fuels, because we want heat to produce energy, to give us electricity, to power our vehicles, and to feed our cows. And that heat is actually a byproduct because some of it can, gets converted to biomass and some of it gets converted to heat. Then we come to the greenhouse effect because this is another component. Now, many of us have been told the greenhouse effect is a bad thing. No, it's not a bad thing because without the greenhouse effect, our atmosphere would cool right down to the temperature of the moon. Now, you can go to the moon when the sun's shining on you at 60 degrees and when the sun's not shining on you, it's minus 40 degrees. Now, no one can survive that. You need to take a thick jacket and some air and some food. And that doesn't happen on the Earth. Earth, we've got the greenhouse effect, which is fantastic because we've got an atmosphere that actually absorbs after the radiation has come in from the sun, it heats the Earth, and then that heat is given off from the Earth and is absorbed or trapped by some gases in the air. And those are the greenhouse gases. Chief of the greenhouse gases is carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide, remember, is only 0.02, well, actually 3, well, actually 4% of the atmosphere. But it's the most effective in trapping that heat. So the greenhouse effect keeps us warm at night and is a very, very good thing because it allows for life on Earth and it allows the temperature to stay within a range that is habitable. So you've got other greenhouse gases. There's carbon dioxide, there's methane. These are natural. But then there's some baddies, nitrous oxide, chlorofluorocarbons, hydrofluorocarbons, etc. On the right-hand side, you have a list of greenhouse warming potential. And if carbon dioxide is set at 1, methane is 21 times that, nitrous oxide is 310 times, and all these human-produced gases 
are thousands of times more potent at absorbing that heat. And the more of those we produce, the warmer our atmosphere is going to get. So bottom line is, we're producing those, atmosphere is getting warmer, increased carbon dioxide, methane, and all those other gases are increasing the greenhouse effect, leading to warming of the planet. Now, you might still in the back of your mind saying, no, 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 it's a natural cycle. We'll come to that. But let's ask ourselves, where does this carbon dioxide and methane come from? Those are the three biggies. Electricity generation, burning coal, burning oil, burning gas, transport, burning oil, burning coal, not so much coal, but you can get fuel from coal, but mostly taking oil, converting it to petrol and using that. Sometimes we use electricity back to square one. If electricity is produced by coal, it's the same problem. And the third one is agriculture. <clears throat> now, agriculture is shared between methane that cattle produce when they convert grass into digestible food. They produce a lot of methane, and methane is CH4, so it's carbon and hydrogen. And then land and forest, forest clearing. Now, many people will say, well, how do you get more carbon dioxide through clearing land and, and forests? And that's the reason, the reason for that is when you take virgin land, which is breathing or converting carbon dioxide into oxygen and vice versa, 24-7, 365, if you know what I mean, and you replace it with a crop that's only in the field and green, for maximum of 90 days out of that 365, you can see that you've lost a lot of potential for absorbing carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere by replacing natural vegetation with agriculture. Now, of course, we have to eat. So you could say that's unavoidable. So all in all, we have to look at that and say, well, is that what the cause is? And then someone's going to say, but whoa, 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 whoa. Hasn't the temperature of the earth always been changing? Isn't that due to greenhouse gases? Or what is it? Can it be due to greenhouse gases? Well, actually, it's not. And there was a famous Russian scientist who put two and two together a long time ago. And he said, you know, there is a natural heating and cooling that explains the variation before humans came on the planet. And this has to do with the distance of the Earth from the sun. The further the sun is from the Earth, the cooler it will be. The closer the sun is to the Earth, the warmer it will be. And there are natural cycles which coincide about once every 20, uh, sorry, once every 100,000 years, or 120,000 years. And when they coincide, the earth gets really warm, and then they go back again, and they cool again. And it's the cooling and the warming that leads to something called the ice ages. Now, this is a very complicated series of graphs showing the results of analyzing the ice in the Antarctic. And we put down big probes into the ice, taken out long sections of up to six kilometers of ice and analyzed the ice and subjected it to various tests to find out what the carbon dioxide concentration in that ice was relative to a certain time when that ice was formed, the methane concentration, and therefore the temperature, well, not therefore, but also the temperature of the atmosphere. Now, nobody argues with these graphs. These are geological timescales, half a million years, a very short geological timescale, but it's half a million years, and these graphs are accepted. And if we look at the temperature, you see that we've got records that the temperature was actually more or less where it is now. This is the present. This is the past, more or less where it is now, occasionally in our history. But most of the time, the temperature dropped. And this is when the Earth was really, really close to the sun, close to the sun, close to the sun, close to the sun, close to the sun. And there are various feedback loops, but the point is, as soon as the sun and the earth move further apart, we get these cooling periods where it's minus 8 or 10 degrees, cooler than it is right now. And these are the ice ages. And we have evidence of the ice ages, and we know they exist. Now, there is a, a relationship between the temperature, carbon dioxide, and methane. And it's not the kind of relationship we expect. Because there is nobody on the planet at this stage producing carbon dioxide or burning fossil fuels. But when the temperature of the planet is changing, the concentrations of carbon dioxide and methane are also changing. This has to do with carbon dioxide that's dissolved in the oceans and methane that's tied up in permafrost. And you'll see that there's a link that when the temperature is high, the concentration of those gases in the atmosphere is also very high. This graph shows that there's a connection. What's interesting to see is that we've actually been at a very stable part of the Earth's evolution for about the last 20,000 years. And when the temperature is stable, it means that people do not have to move out of their comfort zone to get into a new comfort zone, 
when the temperature changes. So they've settled in the same place and the temperature stayed pretty much constant. And settling in the same place gives you one big advantage. You can plant crops. And those crops you can sow and reap, sow and reap, sow and reap. And if it's fruit trees for 20 years, whereas other crops are annual. And we have civilizations arising in the last 20,000 years that have been very much stable. Some have, some have grown, some have waned, but pretty much stayed the same. So that's the history over the longer term. We don't see any human impact here. There isn't any. Here, it's very, very difficult to see anything. So let's increase that scale. Over the last 800,000 years, the carbon dioxide levels, as we've seen, up and down, 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 whoops, really, really up, beyond anything we've had before in the last million years. And that's very interesting. So the question is, okay, what's the deal with this? Is this a natural cycle? Well, let's keep analyzing. The last thousand years, we've seen temperatures generally decrease. Now, we've got records that go back a thousand years that are a lot more reliable than ice cores because we've got people who've written stories, we've got pollen samples, we've got tree rings, and we've got carbon dating. And we can actually tell what the temperature was like over the last thousand years. There is a bit of error, and that's the yellow, but the error reduces as our technology improves. And eventually, you can see we have very little error because we've got very sophisticated instruments. But what we also see is around about 1900, the trend changes from a subtle decrease to a very steep increase. And in 1998, we hit this record, which went beyond any experimental error for the last thousand years. And that's more or less when the climate scientists woke up and said, you know, there's something going on here. There really is something going on here. And we start analyzing it a little bit more. And this is the global temperature over the last 150 years. Again, the black dots are the annual temperatures. The yellow is the experimental arrow. The blue is the smooth series. And you can see down and up, down and up, down and up. All's good, down and up. But hang on a second. We seem to be going up more than we're going down. It's the escalator. Up more than we're going down. So as scientists, we put trend lines on there. We say, well, let's have a look. 100 years? Hmm. Up. Ah, but that's not so steep. 50 years? Oh. Hang on a second. And then all of a sudden, we notice this cluster here. And we think, what's going on here? This is very high. It's above that line, way above that line. Is the temperature coming down? Wait. Maybe the temperature is coming down. So look at that more carefully. And we say, hang on a second, let's take out all those hot years that are caused by El Nino. And you can see they've been grayed out. So the hot years that have been caused by El Nino, which is a warming of the Pacific Ocean, for reasons we don't completely understand, but it releases a lot of heat into the atmosphere. And all the El Nino years are hotter than the years before. We take them out, and we still see this inexorable trend of temperatures increasing, increasing, increasing. And then... What's worse is that ever since 2014, they're just getting warmer and warmer. It is not cooling. Now, you might say to yourself, whoa, who's doing the measuring? Where's your thermometer? Now, that's pretty much a very valid question, except that what we've done is we've taken similar measurements over similar parts of the world so we can relate them to the historical ones. And never mind how you measure it, wherever you measure it, you can see the temperatures going up. So we can see in the Western Cape, temperatures going up. We can see in Europe, the temperatures going up. We see in Australia, the temperatures going up. There are very, very few places, and most of them are so inaccessible, we can't really trust the records, where we're not sure about that increase. So let's have a little bit further. We are seeing changes that you might say are natural cycles. We maintain they're human-induced. Now, it's very, very difficult for us to be 100% sure so what do we do? Well, we trust the science. We ask scientists to take the models that we've developed that explain what's going on in the atmosphere. Now, these models are very highly sophisticated scientific models, mathematical models, that explain all the processes in the atmosphere that relate to the atmospheric heat cycles. So if there's sunspots, it's got it. If there are volcanoes, it's got it. If there are El Ninos, it's got it. And we say to the scientists, right, run those models for the last thousand years, sorry, the last hundred years, and tell us where the temperature would have been. So we start off in 1900, and we say, right, that's zero. And you can see there are about 10 different color models there, and they run the models from different institutions, and they say, okay, after 100 years, 
you'll see some increase, some decrease, world wobbles backwards and forwards. Every area is different. Wobble, wobble, a bit of cooling in the 60s, a bit of warming. And the natural cycles indicate that by the year 2000, the temperature would have been more or less the same as zero. And we say to them, well, hang on a second. It wasn't. That's the temperature in 2000. This was the change of temperature. What's going on? And they say, well, Anna, you told us natural cycles. So we said, well, what do you mean? They said, well, you said don't include human activity. So he said, aha. So you haven't included any fossil fuel production, oil conversion, any burning of land that's caused by humans. No, nope, that's all natural cycles. So then we said, okay, well, you now introduce all the human-induced carbon dioxide that's been produced. Oh, uh, okay. As they would say in the classics. The defense rests is there is incontrovertible well what's that's debatable i suppose but as far as we're concerned this is proof this is the proof that humans are contributing to climate change or we should say global warming at this point because the point is what is this doing to the climate now as far as we are concerned as scientists this has been proven the evidence has shown it i don't believe in climate change it's not a belief system. I look at the evidence and I accept the evidence. And that's very, very important from a scientific point of view. And as you've heard this figure, 99% of the scientists are happy with this. There's about less than 1% who say, no, 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 no. There are other reasons. And sadly, that research just hasn't been able to convince us. Maybe it's because they've been funded by fossil fuel industry. Maybe it's because their research hasn't been peer reviewed. I'm not going to go into that. As far as we're concerned, we've got better things and bigger things to worry about. And this is this increase we're talking about. You may have heard 2021, and in fact, it's still coming out. This is the Physical Science, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change produced their annual report. This is not the first report, but it's certainly one of the reports that's come out, and it's very, very important for us to understand what this report says. It's the same old, same old. And there have been six reports, and they've all said, listen, guys, climate change is a problem, and it doesn't seem like the world is listening, and this is making it worse. These are some of the things we've seen. I spoke about London. But we've seen temperatures of 51 degrees, 49.6 degrees, 48 degrees. You can't live in those temperatures. You just can't. So this is something very serious. Canada. What? Canada. 50 degrees. Very, very strange. What are the projections saying? Well, this is a complicated map. This comes out the out of, out of the report. But these are the sort of things that the report is producing. And I'm going to skip through those and go to some more of the details. The temperature for Southern Africa or South Africa. DJF is December, January, February, which is summer. We are predicting by 2050 to 2060, we take a decade because we don't like saying one specific year. So it's a decade between 250 to 60. Temperatures are going to increase between 1.8 to 2.4 from the 2000 measurement. 1.8 to 2.4 degrees. Winter temperatures, slightly less, but you can see over a broader area. So this is a concern. But of more of a concern, is the actual individual specific changes that we're going to see days of temperature over 40 are going to increase okay so we look at london they've had one shame we have many more than one and we're trying to grow different crops and we're trying to grow enough food for everybody and this is a bit of a worry let's look at Bourteville. now some of you may have been to Bourteville. it's a fascinating little town because for 360 days of the year nothing happens but for five days of the year, they have a thing called Nampo, which is a harvest festival. And while I know you guys are all into nature conservation, we all have to eat. And I'm going to get to the nature in a bit. But let's look at the Puerteville. It's the center of the maize region. Maize is one of our biggest products in terms of tonnage. And Puerteville is in the center of this. And maize does not like temperatures over 32 degrees. And currently in January, if you look at the gray bars, we get about 10 to 11 days over 32 degrees and if those days occur in a sequence the maize crop really really suffers the future projections are saying and you can see this goes right throughout the year they're very hot days they weren't very hot days in may june july august in our historical record but they start in september and they build up <clears throat> to a maximum in january the projections are saying 
that these number of days is going to increase between 7 and 11 more days. So you pile this on top of that, and all of a sudden you see 17 to 21 days in January are going to be 32 degrees. This is not a good thing. And the worst thing is in a month where it's supposed to cool down like March, where we only get around about three very hot days, that's going to increase between six and ten more hot days. And even in the winter, we're going to see more of these hot days. And this places a lot of stress on maize, which places a lot of stress on food. And of course, we know that maize is fed to cattle and there's impacts of that. So generally, we have temperature threats. Very high temperatures, prolonged heat waves, more evaporation, decreases in soil moisture, drying out, increased soil leaf transpiration, alien vegetation and fire. And this leads to more vegetation damage, whether it's crop vegetation or natural vegetation. It's going to lead to an imbalance and problems as far as the sustainability of the current regime. <clears throat> Aside from that, we're projecting that the Mediterranean regions are going to see more droughts. And you can see it's not just the Mediterranean region, it's the whole mid-latitude region that's going to see more droughts. And our good friends in Australia, also, also, and the whole Mediterranean. And we're seeing this already. So that's a worry. We've already got drought. This is the 36-month precipitation index, and this shows us if it's red that they've had a drought for 36 months. That's not great. This is the vegetation index. Red means the vegetation's dried out. That's not great. And the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, has said this drying is going to affect food production. And when you get a problem with food production, you get massive social problems. What about rainfall? Oh, a very, very good question. I like that question. Can we please have another question? We don't really like that question because the models aren't all that clear. And where you see the hashes on this map means the models don't agree. Where it's clear, the models do agree. And the worries are the brown areas where rainfall is going to get less. And all of a sudden, you see some brown peeking out over here, over southern Africa. Some green over there, which means increases, and some blue over there. Yay! Oh, wait, it's over the sea. Okay, that's not going to help us. So let's look more closely at precipitation, and they'll see, well, the climate averages, temperatures are all going to increase. Okay, no, we're not interested in that. We want to see rainfall. Hmm, climate average, drying in southern Africa. But extreme climate, in other words, extreme rainfall. Hmm, increasing. And this is a worry. So what we've done is I've taken this little this little uh, chart. We've taken all the models that predict wet, all the models that predict dry, and we've averaged them out for the seasons. And I've just centered it on Vorteville there. And I've said, right, what's going to happen in Vorteville? Well, it's a summer rainfall region. So in Vorteville, the projections are some are saying very dry, up to 10 millimeters a month more. Some are saying it's going to get wetter, up to 20 millimeters a month more. So 10 millimeters a month less to 20. The average is? Well, kind of in the middle, a little bit wetter, maybe. But a lot of the country, summer rainfall region, going to get drier. We get to, to autumn, which is really a bit of a nothing season. There's not much rainfall anywhere. Western Cape, dry. Waterville, 20 millimeters drier, maybe 15 millimeters more. But it's getting onto the dry season. The really dry season, uh, not much difference. But in the back of our mind, we're seeing this red around the southwestern Cape. And it's not looking like there's much wetness. And this is our winter. And this is one of the worries. There are some models that are saying it's going to get wetter, but most of the saying it's going to get drier. So we've got some issues with this. We don't know for sure, but the threat is there. General picture for Southern Africa. Likely decrease in rainfall on the west. Likely increase in rainfall on the east. Increases in temperature most of the place. And a few cases where the temperature increase might not be very much. So it's not looking great for the country, especially when you look at the Western and Northern Cape. A lot hotter with less rainfall. And you can see the trees and the dams drying and the soil drying out there. These guys may be getting a little more rainfall. Is the rainfall going to come all at once? Hmm, good question. Let me see. Have we had any floods in KZN recently? Oh, dear. Yes, we have. So how does this affect us? Well, whatever activity you're doing, whatever you are, if it's nature, if it's a natural nature reserve, if it's crops, if it's farming cattle, if it's just living in a house, you live within a certain area, a certain variation of climate. And there's a critical threshold. If you go beyond that threshold, then you begin to suffer. You become very, very vulnerable. And you've learned to cope to the variation. 
But if this change in climate means that that climate goes out of your coping area over your critical threshold, you're either going to die. In other words, you're not going to be able to adapt, whatever you are, or you're going to adapt to this by increasing or increasing your coping capacity through adaptation. And that's what we see is going to happen because we don't see it's possible that we're going to reduce our carbon emissions. I haven't shown you the projections of carbon emissions, but they're not looking good. There's no sign of them turning down. So what can we do? <clears throat> we have to ask ourselves, what are the risks of a higher temperature? The timing of ecological cycles, crop maturity, harvesting, are these going to change? What are the risks of reduced temperature range? What's the impact on fertilizer, pesticide, herbicide application? This is mainly focused on agriculture. Why? Because we're talking about food. But you can see the connection between the natural environment, especially when it comes to fire, pests, and alien vegetation. Increased irrigation requirements. Well, we just add more water. Do we have more water? What's the quality of crop and vegetation? Will it have the same carrying capacity? Will it be able to support the same animals? How are we going to deal with different pests and breeding cycles? What's going to happen to that? Questions we are asking. Now it comes to a very sensitive thing, and that is water. Now, if you live in the Western Cape or in the Eastern Cape, this is a very, very serious issue. And when you look at the sectors that use water, you see, ah, oh, you see, it's all the farmers' fault. I knew it. It's the farmers. Well, if you ate breakfast, lunch, or supper tonight, you got to thank a farmer. Because most of the water in our country goes to producing the food that you purchase off the supermarket shelf. And we need to worry about this because obviously if there's a, less water, it's going to impact those sectors the most. So this is the back of our mind. Why is there a water crisis? This is just random. Low and unpredictable supply of water. Agriculture needs water. There's still a need for water and sanitation. There's a high demand for water. And there's poor use and management of our existing resources. Doesn't matter where it is. Water quality is bad. Rivers are polluted. Dams are polluted. The groundwater is polluted. This is a problem. Oh, my goodness. Now we talk about day zero. This was a very serious thing for us in the Western Cape because someone worked out, and we're not sure if it's a good or a bad thing, that we're going to run out of water. No, we can't. We can't. We can't run out of water. And fortunately, it rained. And we postponed day zero to we don't know when, but it's going to happen again. Oh, what about fires? When it gets dry, you get more fires. Variations in global wildfire, danger. Increasing. Fire seasons have increased. They've lengthened. It's becoming more prone to fire. Persistent fire weather season increases in ecosystems that are Mediterranean regions. More frequent burning. Now, we all love natural vegetation. But when natural vegetation burns, and burns too often, it's not necessarily a good thing. And then we see aliens coming in. And the land is threatened. The natural regions are threatened. In California, massive fires in 2021. Journalist asked, do you think the average person is making their connection between the fires, climate change, and the increased likelihood in the future? Expert? So, not enough. Journalists don't really bother to explain this. Journalists haven't got the time to write a long article. They don't know what's going on. It's important to explain that this is leading to an increase in wildfires. I'm summarizing there. We don't want that. President Trump said nobody thought this could ever happen in 2019. He'd been warned. He'd been warned. We've been standing and we're saying to people, climate change is going to cause impacts. Fire is devastating. It's not a case of adapting to fire. Fire kills. Fire destroys. That's just one of the things. What about melting ice? You would have heard of melting ice. We're all going to die. That poor polar bear is a Hollywood actor in a bear skin. He's just sitting there to get the picture. It's not about polar bears. It's about the fact that melting ice is going to do one of two things. It's going to change the nature of the ecology of the land mass that it's on. It's going to change the temperature of the sea if it's floating. And it's going to change the global albedo, which means reflection of light back into the space, which means revealed land is now going to absorb more heat, and this is going to cause feedback. And then lastly, but not least, it's going to cause increased sea level rise. Hmm. Arctic has changed. This is meant to be animated, but I'm not going to skip that. The Arctic Ocean, this is floating ice, and the ice on Greenland has been slowly but surely 
melting. It increases some years, it decreases some years, but generally speaking, it's decreased by about 50% in the last 50 years. And it's increasing more and more. Now that ice is not going to cause sea level rise because that ice is floating. But if you see that ice on Greenland, it's not floating. And there are many, many glaciers there and Greenland is already melting. If that ice sheet on Greenland all melts, and it's not happening now, but it could happen any time, seven meter increase in sea level. Now seven meters is a lot. And then the West Arctic ice sheet may also melt. If either of them melt completely, there's enough ice and water to raise the sea level by seven. Both happens 14 meters. I'm sorry, if you're living in Morgan Bay and if you're living in Betty's Bay, and I know some of you are, you're underwater. This is not unlikely in the next 50 to 100 years. Mm, we don't even go to Pacific Island countries, but this is the Maldives who had a cabinet meeting underwater to try and make a protest to show that their island could be completely destroyed. No one really took any notice. Then there's the Atlantic thermohaline circulation. This is the circulation of water throughout the oceans. And the most important part of it is this Gulf Stream, this current that takes warm water to Northern Europe and keeps Northern Europe temperatures reasonably warm at a latitude where elsewhere in the world they're covered by ice. That could shut down. More water melting in the polar regions, more fresh water, blocking the movement of thermohaline, warm and salty water, blocking that so that the warm water can't get in. Now, you might not have a scenario like this, which was a movie called The Day After Tomorrow. Might not be quite that bad, but it's a threat. We're not saying it's going to happen tomorrow, though. Whew, I'm sure you're depressed. There is some good news, though. And there's still some questions that we don't understand, but we can make a difference. We know that the COPs, and they seem to go on forever, we're up to, I think, COP25 now, Conference of the Parties, and they're developing protocols, and some of them work and some of them don't. But there are protocols in place. Whether people are going to actually follow up on decreasing emissions, we don't know. Already we know we're talking about using more efficient energy. 20 years ago, solar was few and far between. Now it's everywhere. We can reduce our water consumption. We can adapt to changes in rainfall. We just have to know how. Our coping capacities can be increased through good planning. We need to get used to rapid readiness and not rapid response. We cannot afford to respond to a climate change disaster. We have to be ready for it. And then things like sustainable and regenerative agriculture, working with nature instead of against nature, are becoming more and more popular. These are good signs. So I can talk a little bit more about our personal response to climate change, but I think our time is up and I'd like to have some time for questions. The big question, the meta question, if you like, even if climate change is a massive hoax, everything we're doing to try and solve the problem is a good thing for the planet. So no one, I think, should turn around and say that we're trying to make the planet worse. And some people are saying that, and that's very sad. Thank you very, very much for your time. So for our questions and answers session, what we'll do is I will give a first chance to the live audience. You can use the reaction tools provided by Zoom. Just Put up a hand or jump up and down, wave at me, and I will uh, give you a chance for your questions. And then we will um, move to the, uh, we'll jump to the chat section um, if there are any. So the board and the screen is open for questions and answers. Um, good evening. Good evening. Um, so last, me and my friend, we were having this discussion and it ended up in a debate of how correct me if I'm wrong, of how there is fresh water trapped in ice and this melting ice is kind of benefiting us because we are getting more water from it. So I wanted to know what Dr. Justin is thinking about this. Would you like me to answer the questions as they come or should I wait for a few? No, no, you can you can answer them as they come. So that, that's an interesting question. Uh, we must understand that water is only useful if it's where you need it. And the ice melting is all very nice. And you go down to New Zealand and you go into um, Norway and Iceland and Greenland and there's ice all over the place. They never have a shortage of water. 
because that melting ice is always available to them. The point and the problem is <clears throat> once the ice is melted, you surely do have more water. If it's on top of Kilimanjaro, there's more water. But once that water has been used up and gone, and that ice is gone, it's not very likely to come back again. And that's a problem. So that's resource, if you like. And, and we have it in the Western Cape that when it snows, we get a lot of ice on the mountains and that ice or snow melts and we have a whole lot of water available. If that's not going to happen as often and those ice caps aren't going to be replenished, then it's not a sustainable source of water. So two things. Firstly, the water is not necessarily where people need it, which is in warm, dry areas. And secondly, once the water has melted, it ceases to be a sustainable resource. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, Christian, there we go. Screen's all yours. Yes, good evening, everyone. Yeah, uh, I would like to ask a question about the global warming. I was thinking that maybe in years that can come, industries can develop a, a system that can allow them to store their, say, their, their carbon dioxide and then exposes to a very low temperature so that it can it can be in the liquid in the liquid form and then they can change it like with a some chemical process i don't know if it's that's possible thank you for the question we're looking at a lot of different technologies to try and sequester or draw carbon dioxide or reduce the amount of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and um, the thing is that the simple answer is very often the best answer. And the simple answer is that we need to produce less carbon dioxide. So one has to look at ways of producing electricity, of transport, and of getting enough food on the planet without producing too much carbon dioxide. So on the one hand, you've got some people who look at technological ways of doing this. Maybe there's a chemical that can go to the atmosphere that can convert carbon dioxide to something else. Maybe we can try and extract carbon dioxide from the pollution that's being produced. Maybe we can convert the carbon dioxide into liquid carbon dioxide and we can bury it or we can do something else with it. It's really, really tricky because most of those processes involve using electricity or more energy. So unless that energy is coming from a sustainable, re renewable resource, you're just making the problem worse. We feel that it's in fact a lot easier if we look at the amount of carbon dioxide we're producing and the way we produce it. So we can convert wholesale from burning of oil, if we can get rid of that, and it is feasible. It's many countries are doing it, and the countries that are producing the most, are in fact, are countries that are getting the most sunshine and actually have alternatives. So we feel, and that's many, me and many of my colleagues, that by doing some prevention of carbon dioxide releases in the first place, and then saying to the other scientists, listen, see what you can do in technological advances, but in case you can't, we're going to be working on the core problem anyway. So we're going to try and make your problem smaller by producing less, and you try and make our problem smaller by technological advances. So we're not denying the fact that there may be technologies, but we are saying that in case there aren't, right now we need to concentrate on what we can do. Okay, thank you. I, I also have another question. Yeah, I would you like to ask... Ahead. Sorry? Am you I can go ahead. Okay, okay. So I would like to ask, they've been talking about a, a wall that has been formed in the uh, ozone layer. But I always ask, I'm, I'm always asking myself, uh, ozone layer is uh, uh, actually a case, it's CO3, I think. CO2. O3. 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 It's actually a gas. So how does it happen that there is a wall inside the, in the gas? So I don't do this very often, but I am going to say to you that that is a completely different subject. Um, the ozone hole has very, very little to do with carbon dioxide, and it has to do with chemicals that are being released that are changing the nature of the atmosphere and actually destroying ozone. So if you don't mind, I'm going to ask you to do your own research on that and find out about the ozone layer and the ozone effect, because it isn't a climate change issue. So I hope you don't mind me doing that, but please do some research and you'll see that while there's a small connection between uh, ozone depletion and climate change, the main deal with the ozone layer has to do with pollutants that we are emitting on the, on the planet. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Christian. Uh, we're going to move to Bridget. 
Bridget, I'm unmuting you or asking to unmute. Thank you so much. I see a lot of sustainable and regenerative um, agriculture happening in small pockets. It's almost like a, not a cult, but it seems to be in particular areas. Is what I call mainstream agriculture, is there research being done into more sustainable ways? Um, when I, I get particularly worried when I see huge milli fields, which are not covered out of the growing season. In Europe during the floods, you saw these great fields of mud being washed away. And it seems to me counterintuitive that this should still be happening. Is there a, a mainstream move to more sustainable ways of doing agriculture? Hi, that was Bridget, was it? Yes. yes, it was. Hi, Bridget. That's a, a really big question that I really can't answer in as much detail as I'd like to now. But let me just say to you that, first of all, when it comes to any sort of upstart activity, and especially in the environmental movement, there's a lot of disunity. And right now, if you asked one scientist what regenerative sustainable agriculture is, and you asked another scientist what it is, and you asked 100 scientists, you'd probably get at least 50 different answers. It's very hard to put a definition on there, and it's very hard to decide what is regenerative and what isn't. The catchphrase amongst the mainstream industry now is climate smart agriculture, which has nothing to do with sustainable regenerative agriculture. But they are unfortunately using this as an excuse into saying we're doing climate smart agriculture. And what are they using? They're using seeds and chemicals and machines and techniques to make their crop grow under whatever climate they have. There are some crossovers. The Western Cape wheat industry is very much bought into conservation agriculture. They still use chemicals. But you will see ground cover wherever you are. I spent the day in the wheat region today. There's no bare soil. The farmers know better. So even on the fields, they're not growing wheat. There's cover. In summer, you go there, there's stubble on the fields. Many maize farmers are starting to turn the corner and saying this will work. And those regenerative meetings that you see here and there scattered over the country are attracting more and more attention and more and more scientific investigation. Now, you will not get rid of the chemical companies. You will not get rid of chemical agriculture because they are a huge economic player in this sphere of agriculture. And they have their uses. But sooner or later, I think many farmers are going to realize with the threat of climate change and increasing variability, they need to be more in tune with nature. And little by little, we're trying to convince them to move away from chemicals. And I'm not going to go into any more of that because I think it, it'll, it'll take too long, but I hope that's helped. Thank you very much. That's, that's comforting to hear that there are talks in that direction. Thank you very much, Bridget. Um, so then I'm going to move to Patrick. I'm going down the line as uh, your hands go up, so you'll all get a chance. Patrick, I'm going to ask you to unmute and then you can ask your question. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes, Indeed, you can. Can. can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, thanks, Peter, old comrade. Um, right now we have the DMRE, the Department of Mineral Energy, Minerals and Energy Resources, and they're pretty much ignoring the science and suggesting that we burn our way out of the problem by exploiting onshore and offshore gas and oil not to mention the coal reserves that we have already. What do their officials say when you and other climate scientists talk to them about this? Thanks. Gee, Patrick, thanks for that. As you say, we go back a long way and I wasn't expecting an easy question from you, so well done. <laughs> um, Patrick, you know, they get this faraway look in their eye and you can see them thinking as politicians, you know, who am I gonna make the happiest here? If I think about burning coal, we've got a whole lot of coal farmers. Coal farmers, you know what I mean? Miners and people who own coal fields. And these are supporting ESCOM, and ESCOM is a state-owned enterprise, and ESCOM, you know, does what it's supposed to do by burning coal. And we need more of this stuff because we don't have enough electricity. 
And when you start talking sustainable development, their eyes kind of glaze over and they just don't seem to get it. And it takes a jolt, a realization, a Damascus conversion, if you like, to try and persuade many of our leaders that we cannot keep on doing this. Two big excuses they come. First of all, we've got the resource, we're blessed with the resource, we should use it. The second one is, why us? All the other countries have managed to do this for hundreds of years, let's not say hundred, but a hundred years, and get away with it. And now you're trying to tell us that we mustn't do it. So the two answers that we give them is because we're actually contributing to the problem. We're being part of the problem. Can we not be part of the solution? We'll get recognition, we'll get kudos, and we will develop our own economies through being part of the solution. And the second one is, there's jobs in them that are hills. You know, if we can convert to sustainable energy through solar and, 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 and wind, there are just as many jobs there, and they're not destroying the health of the people who are working in those jobs. And that's, I think, where we keep plugging at them. And slowly but surely, within local governments, more than national governments, we are making having some impact. And it's guys like you that also stand outside a building or stand in a, or get involved in legislation and policy that are also making changes. So we must not give up, Patrick. You know, we are getting old and gray and we start thinking, well, we've got to hand the reins over, but there are plenty of younger people out there. There's 91 people listening. At least half of them are young. And I know that they're going to take up the cudgels. I know you have to go and show us that we're gray. Yes, well, the gray bit. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's all I can say about it, Patrick. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Great talk. Thank you, Patrick. Let's go to Ruth. Ruth, asking you to unmute. Um, <clears throat> and I'll put my video in, uh, if you can see me. I'm with yes. my dad. Um, Peter, very nice talk. Thank you very much. Um, I went to UCT ye years ago. Years ago. My alma mater. Um, I'm an agriculturalist and we do a lot of work. I'll take my glasses off. We do a lot of work with sustainable agriculture and trying to sort of climate smart ag agriculture and everything. My question today is with all the emissions, can they put the emissions through something to capture the carbon dioxide, the methane, the nitrous oxide, capture it into a liquid and not send it into the atmosphere? Or is that possible or not? So we just had a question very similar to that, Ruth. And uh, take, take, I'm just going to sort of bunch that under technologies. And, and as I said before, we are hoping that those technologies may exist. And I was speaking to some, some farmers <clears throat> yesterday, <clears throat> and they were saying that they are looking at different types of feed and funnily enough, making animals healthier, giving them different kinds of feed and making them healthy will lead to them producing fewer emissions. So the answer is not simple. And if it, if it were, if we could put a tea strainer on the atmosphere and strain out all the carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide and methane, that would be wonderful. But we can't. These are invisible gases. We can't see them. It's very hard to detect. And they get mixed very quickly in the atmosphere and they go to high levels where it's very difficult to then go and extract them. So the short answer is no. The long answer is we need to work on different technologies, whatever they may be. And that's why we need more people like you in agricultural research. We want younger people to go into research. We want the government to fund more research because there are answers out there and we'd like to find them and apply them. And for that, we may have to fight the existing status quo like the chemical companies and that we need to do. We need, so with us, we have a belief that you have fusion farming. So with the agriculture, um, you protect the soil as much as possible, but you have to feed people and farmers have to have a yield so that they can have an income so they, they can carry on farming. So we do a lot of fum, fusion farming, we call it, where we mix the organic, the biological, the regenerative, of the climate smart and try and have a happy medium where the soil benefits and the farmer benefits right I was asking, busy. sorry yeah sorry uh, he wants to go on but what i was asking the emissions from all the um when you're burning coal and everything can they capture those emissions into 
water. So it's very, it's very <laughs> difficult um, when you're burning these in a, in a fire station. They do have electrostatic filters which take out the, the particulate matter. But now you've got a mixture of gases coming out of the pipes. And, and what do you do? Do you suck it off, uh, compress it into a, a big tank and pump it into the ground? In which case you've just tripled the cost of producing that electricity and of mining that coal. Now that you might say is a good thing because then it's going to say to people, well, coal mining isn't sustainable. doesn't make any sense. But you see, it's called an externality. Once that pollution is in the air, there's no owner. That is gone. That's all of our problems. It doesn't belong to the power station anymore. So it's a really, really hard question. And it's as hard as asking what kind of water is going into our rivers flowing off farms. Can we not stop those chemicals going into the water? Can we not filter them off? Technological questions, as I said, we need research on how to do that. The short answer is it's going to take a long answer. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Ruth. Uh, Sorry, if get... I can just say, I suggest you get that lady on, Bridget, on, so it, was not, it wasn't Bridget, uh, Ruth. You get Ruth on to give you a talk on that uh, fusion agriculture, but that's just a suggestion. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Make it, we'll, we'll make a note of that. The team at the back will make a note. Uh, Lisa Marie, you are up next. Hello, thank you. I, I have a lot of questions, but I'll just start with one and then I'll give other people chances again. I want to ask, I have a friend in Zimbabwe who um, he recently has a borehole. He had a, he made some, he's, he's in charge of an orphanage. They really don't have a lot of money. And uh, he managed to get enough money together for a borehole. And now he wants to plant anything, and him and he he and his wife they um, they grew up farming, but I'm assuming it's traditional farming. And now they're asking, you know, for the same people that helped them, and I'm I'm one of the group, one of the people in the group that helped them. They're asking now for seeds, and I I'm just scared that they start something and it doesn't work in this new climate because they don't have the information. But I don't know who to ask in Zimbabwe who can maybe help them. Where should, what should they farm? Who should they farm with? Like anyone, so that they're not on, on their own and that they don't pour money into something that maybe doesn't work because of the climate. I don't know if you can advise me. No, so the, and when, when, you, you, when you're a little bit of an expert, you recognize that there's some things that you shouldn't try and answer because you're not an expert on that. And this is one of them. So I really suggest there are two things you could look at. One is that there's, there are graphs and maps that the FAO have put out that show crop suitability in different regions. And you can actually fiddle with those and see whether the suitability changes under a future climate. So if they're going to grow maize, for example, and it's a certain type of maize, the best thing to do is to grow, to look at the types of maize that have done well in those extreme conditions or in conditions where, you know, this future is likely to situate. But the other thing is to ask agricultural organizations that are close to those people and say extension officers, although they may be a bit influenced by tradition than, than by the new climate. Um, research institutes, certainly in, certainly in South Africa, like the ARC, are looking at things like that, but they may not be accessible for people. So I'm sorry I can't help you anymore, but maybe that's some advice you can take. Okay. Can I just ask something and, and just quickly about that? There's a lot of people talking about regenerational farming with, with cattle. Ellen Savory has done a lot of work on it. Does that look like something that I could maybe um, contact? Do you think from your experience, is it hype or is it something that's really working? So that's, uh, you know, if you say something on this, you're going to, you're going to make enemies uh, either way. Um, mm -hmm. My personal belief, my exposure is that there's a place for livestock in the savannah system, in an agricultural system. Certainly I work with uh, regenerative farmers um, like Farmer Angus at, at Spear and he works with cattle and pigs and chickens and he does it very, very well. And the quality of his food and the quality of his soil and the quality of his environment is so good that he actually attracts funding from, from carbon credits. So you might have ethical problems with eating animals, and, and I can't comment on that, but there are ways of integrating animals into natural cycles. Alan Savory has shown it. Many regenerative farmers are saying there is a way and there is a place for that. If we all did that at the rate of us meat consumption that is current, we need the whole planet just to grow meat, and that's impossible. So we need to cut down on our, on our food consumption, especially our dense protein consumption like animals. But then I guess if we all eat two meals a week at least, the 
don't contain meat, we could make a massive difference. And I think that's the way to go. And then if we're looking at eating quality instead of quantity, that's even better. And then obviously we need to eat less beef and more of the of the the the, and the uh, sort of protein that produces less carbon. And I'm not and I, I'm not going to close the door on on plant-based protein either. I think that's fantastic, and one should all look at eating more of that. But this is another whole topic. Thank you very much, uh, Doc and Lisa Marie. I'm going to move on, Lisa, uh, just to finish up the questions, and then we can come back. Komoto. Your hands went up for quite some time. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I just wanted to ask, our continent is fairly fortunate in terms of its placement uh, with regards to hurricanes and cyclones, especially as compared to America. I wanted to ask, uh, how, how, what have the trends been recently with regards to hurricanes and cyclones? Um, has it changed? Hamotsu, I must just uh, point out to you that if you speak to the people in Mozambique, they're going to disagree very, very strongly with you. Um, Madagascar, Mozambique, Mauritius, these guys have been hit by more hurricanes and what we call cyclones in our part of the world than they have before. And, and two things are happening. The cyclones seem to be a lot more intense. And secondly, because of the increasing population, the impacts are far higher. We're also seeing um, cyclones hitting Somaliland, Somalia, in, in the sort of Horn of Africa, and that's also causing a lot of drama. So the situation in Africa, there is, we're relatively protected. There's some cyclones also happening in the bulge um, on the west coast of Africa. Um, we're seeing a more energetic ocean. Sea surface temperatures are rising, and we know that there's a critical temperature of around 25 degrees for the formation of a cyclone and a hurricane. We're seeing these conditions being reached more and more often. So we're expecting to see more hurricanes. We're not certain, though, if those hurricanes and cyclones are going to be more powerful. But certainly more of them means we're increasing our vulnerability and we're increasing our exposure. And there are various parts of the world. And you must understand that what happens in one part of the world ultimately has an impact on the rest of us. So if there's a cyclone that hits Mozambique and makes 2 million people homeless, it is going to impact on us. Two reasons. One is that the physical rainfall is going to extend to parts of South Africa. But secondly, there are going to be economic issues that are going to affect us through our neighbors. Wonderful. Thank you, Komoto. Um, and then I'm just making sure, Cecilia Liebenberg, uh, do you have a question or are you just reacting to some of Dr. Johnson's uh, responses? Um, sorry, I'm just um, cheering. I'm <laughs> cheering. <laughs> Thank you very much. Just making sure. Thank you, Cecilia. Then um, Janssen Davies, and then I'm going to move to the chat section. Um, Janssen, the screen's all yours. Uh, thank you, Ruan. Uh, Dr. Johnson, wonderful presentation, very thought provoking, very useful. Thank you. Um, getting back to Patrick's question and unpacking that a little deeper, uh, we are particularly interested in trying to understand the zeitgeist, if you like, of world thinking as to why this scientific evidence of uh, climate change or climate crisis seems so difficult to get traction. Uh, we've seen the uh, financial crisis in 2008. We saw the wonderful response to that. Uh, we've seen a pandemic. We've seen an over-response to that worldwide, almost in some opinions, uh, in terms of how our governments and our people responded to that. How is it then possible that such a much more threatening uh, potential threat, do you think, is, is, is kind of eluding us uh, in terms of our, our deeper insights? Uh, I would be interested in your theory on that. Yeah. I'm a bit Monty Pythonish on that. I, I don't have a theory. Um, I wish I did, but every time I have a theory, I kind of shoot myself in the foot. It's a bit like the frog in the saucepan where the water temperature is rising so slowly that the frog doesn't realize how much trouble he or she is in. And we see more and more events happening around the world affecting other people. And when they do affect us, we think, okay, well, there's our, that was our, our number came up today and we got affected. 
What is happening though is through intergenerational change is happening such that people who've been on the earth around for a while are noticing these changes, whereas the young people aren't. And the young people, if they're exposed to this, kind of turn to the old people and say, you caused this. And it's very difficult. So there's kind of a cognitive dissonance. You, you don't like to admit that we've caused this through our lifestyle. We don't like thinking that we may have to change our lifestyle. We don't like thinking that we're all going to be in trouble because it seems so far off. You know, we throw out numbers like 2100, 2050. But that's closer than 2000 is to where we are now. Well, virtually. I mean, we're halfway to 2050. And we're seeing the projections saying, listen, it's becoming more and more certain that our planet is going to be unlivable by later on in the century. We're not going to be able to grow the kind of crops. Now, how do you instill that kind of shock and awe into population without them just saying, oh, throw up my hands. I can't do anything about it. We're all going to die. You know, let's just have another glass of whatever. And it's very tricky to find someone who's actually going to sit down and say, well, let's do something. Let's see if we can solve that problem. Because that person is going to be long dead by the time the problem is solved. And you have, I mean, let's just take our good friend environmentalist. I won't mention his name now, but he will say to you, I'm old and gray. I'm not going to be around when a lot of these impacts hit us. My children are going to be around. So I'm fighting for my children. And the children are saying, well, thanks a lot for fighting for us. What do we need to do? And that's where education plays a very, very important role. If we can get this education, I was involved myself in getting climate change into the school syllabus. And I know it's been taught there, but who's it being taught by? It's been taught by a teacher who has not been trained. So the teacher kind of glosses over it in half a lesson and says, well, you know, climate change is a problem. What causes climate change? Now, it's hard to explain to someone what causes climate change. I've just spent an hour doing that, and I do it often. And people walk away and they kind of shake their heads and they say, we're all going to die. You know, and, and we don't want them to do that. We want them to say, I'm going to do something to change it. Now, I don't know if you're in behavioral sciences, but maybe you can help us do this. And we've got in our department at UCT, we've got people who are looking at philosophy, economics, psychology, to try and understand what helps people to make decisions. And let's help them do that by giving them the information that they need. But you can't scare the I was going to say a bad word. You can't scare the, the what's it out of people just by shouting at them. They're not necessarily going to change their behavior. Mm -hmm. And and so we, we need to understand it very carefully. So there's my theory. It's not much of a theory, but I hope that's helpful. Thank you very much. Chris Murray, I'm sure, has got an uh, interesting insight to add to that uh, coming from his background. But anyway, thanks, uh, Ron. Thank you, Janssen. Uh, Chris, before I go to uh, Dr. Taylor, do you want to make a comment? Okay, cool. Dr. Taylor, the, I'm asking you to unmute. The uh, screen's all yours. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Peter, for, for the talk. It was great. Uh, let me just put my video on quickly. Um, I a very easy question for you. Um, you know, it bothers me sometimes how how do you convince traditionally low carbon emission uh, communities, societies, and countries, for example, to change their actions and behavior when the problem is predominantly due to the emissions from more developed industrial societies? Easy answer, Llewellyn. Show <laughs> them the money. You literally show them the money in two ways. Yeah. One is direct payments for carbon credits. In other words, you say to those guys, listen, you cut down on your carbon emissions, we'll pay you to do that. Now, that's not a zero sum game because it means that someone is still producing emissions, which is a bad thing. But once those countries then see that there's money in this and they expand their renewable energy resources, they lift themselves up and they use those, they leapfrog the traditional trajectories, that's fantastic. And it turns out to be a good thing. The other thing is to, for the rich countries, maybe to say, OK, we're going to help you. We're not going to help you stop this thing because we're actually the problem, but we're going to help you get over it. Now, while adaptation is a Band-Aid, it's not solving the problem. But if you can adapt to something, so it's a permanent response. So your way of life has changed to accept that vulnerability and lead you to be able to cope then that coping capacity, your resilience is increased. And that can be done through finance. So they really are, if the rich countries are not going to set an example, and look at them, what's happening now. Everyone's got into a panic about Russia. It's all about energy. 
And if I can't yeah. get the clean energy they want, I'm going to go and freaking get the dirty energy and dig it all up again. Because they're desperate. In fact, in France today, the government in Paris, the government asked people to turn off their appliances because they didn't have enough electricity. So this could be a big thing. This could be the next big thing. Yeah. And we need to look at ways that the developing countries and the, and, the, and the developed countries come to a discussion and talk about this. And that's essentially what does happen at COP. But you know what happens with developing countries. They normally go away from the table with a couple of morsels and the big countries are rubbing their hands in glee. At Equitable's world, we do not have. Sadly, we just don't have. And there isn't a big stick or a government that can actually fix that problem. So we've got to work from the bottom up and help developing countries to access this kind of finance through the ways I've mentioned. Yeah, I've been to a couple of the COPs and one of the things that struck me about that was, uh, well, the question is, you know, to, to what extent have we actually gone down that road so far um, in terms in terms of that? I, I just don't know. I get the feeling that we haven't really gone that far worldwide. No, I, I th well, not worldwide, but certainly if we look through Africa, uh, I was just in, in Nairobi a couple of weeks ago. There are wind turbines. They're looking at the big solar farms. And in fact, because the solar energy competes for land through agriculture, they've actually raised the solar farms. So the solar farms are on stilts and there's gaps between them. And they can grow crops underneath those solar farms and they can have animals feeding on pastures. And in fact, the solar farms create shade and cool areas on the agricultural areas. So they can grow crops that, you know, normally you'd put shade netting over, but now you've got a dual purpose thing. And, you know, this is this has been introduced by a foreign country through some sort of aid, maybe, or some agreement. Um, a lot of it is, is Chinese fed and the Chinese don't give without taking. So that's a little bit of a worry. Yeah. But we are seeing developments in, in these countries because the opportunities are enormous. When you've got citizens of a country that have no access to electricity, just a little electricity is fantastic. And that you can do through projects like solar and wind. So I yeah, think sure. I think we should be positive about it. I think it is happening. Those technologies are a lot easier to implement than saying, well, let's go and look for some coal in a neighboring country and maybe you can use that. Even though there's still a heck of a lot of research into fossil fuels, the committed money involved in searching for gas and oil deposits is still in the billions of dollars every year. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Taylor and Dr. Peter. Um, one question from the chat. Um, given the time lag for many processes, uh, is it already too late for us to stop this from Louise Cotton? Okay, so it's also a big question. Stop this. There are degrees of stopping. If we can reduce our emissions to level off by 2050, we are still going to overshoot the 1.5. We're going to hit maybe two degrees. But if you change the trajectory, then at least you can see a little bit further into the future that there might be more hope. So if we change the trajectory of those emissions, and I wish I'd put an emissions graph, but as you can see, my presentation was very busy. But at the moment, <coughs> excuse me, at the moment we're just heading upwards. And it's going to need a concerted effort by governments to reduce those kind of emissions. And the, if you are absolutely right about the time lag. I can't remember who said it, but... If we reduce the emissions now, it's still going to take 20 years or so for the impact of that to be felt because of the sort of long term um, staying power of these gases in the atmosphere. Some of them are, are very stay very short, like methane doesn't last in the atmosphere very long, but carbon dioxide does. And so methane's got a very high warming potential, but its longevity is much lower than, than carbon dioxide. So there is going to be some time, but the, you know, they'd say the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. And the second best time is now. Uh, so we need to start doing these things now without saying, oh, it's not going to make any difference. That is just not an argument. It's not an option. Thank you, Doctor. And on that note, uh, Rose Sanderson asked, trees, we need to plant more trees in the cities. Um, and then, uh, so any, um, any comment on that? Yeah, I think the answer, there was an answer in the tech in the chat as well. Yet, yes. But no, the point is, trees are very good things. The trees are very good things. They help to cool down a city. They reduce the heat island effect. They reduce the, the airflow and they increase precipitation. If you need increased precipitation and if you need shade and if you need cool, plant a tree. 
but don't plant a tree that doesn't belong there. Be very careful where you plant your trees. And there's been research shown that reforestation of some African countries has produced negative results, negative consequences. Because if the trees weren't already there and now you plant them there, you could change the whole ecosystem. And that's not necessarily a good thing. So it's not easy. Anyone who says, oh, I'm going to fly to Europe and I'm going to plant a tree to offset my, my emissions, wrong. You need to plant 200 trees to offset your emissions. You need to plant the right kind of trees. For example, speckboom is a great carbon dioxide absorber. It sequesters carbon. But you can't plant speckboom everywhere. You know, you go into Kirstenbosch Garden and dig up Kirstenbosch Garden and say, I'm going to plant speckboom everywhere. You're going to get shot mm -hmm. because there are conservationists there who know what, how it works. So while it is a good plant to plant, and I'm not knocking it, I've got six or seven in my house, um, one must be very, very careful. You have to take the whole picture, the holistic picture, into account before you do some sort of radical actions. Short answer, trees are brilliant. Plant more of them, but plant the right ones. Thank you very much. And then one last question, I think, Chris, then we'll call it the evening. I know it's still very busy, but we've been uh, busy for an hour and a half now. Uh, from Professor N. Young, all the way from Nigeria, my question, can the presenter tell us if the climate change um, excuse me, if the climate change has impacted wild species, species ranging patterns, as it has done to transhumanism in Western Africa. So I'm not the animal biologist, but I have heard and I have read articles that are saying that um, the symbiotic relationship between different types of animals, for example, birds and butterflies or birds and worms and birds and moths, specifically with birds, have meant that birds have arrived at their traditional breeding sites or feeding sites after migration. And because the climate has changed in the destination country, that food isn't available. Now that is obviously a bit of a shock to everybody and it might be a, a, you know, an exaggerated effect, but we are seeing the fact that different types of grasses and trees, example, in the savanna, are changing the nature of the savanna. And it may mean that the biomass potential for those animals to feed on that grass or those, that vegetation is changing and that could have an impact but you'd really have to ask a scientist who's intimately involved in that but the, the right the, 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 the positive answer that I know that I can say is it is going to have an impact on the natural environment there is no question about it you cannot suddenly at the rate of increasing temperatures and messing with rainfall um, variability we messing with it is a bad word but the way that that's changing is definitely going to impact on the natural environment and that includes large and small animals thank you very much and then one question from i know i said but the last one from ruth ruth gonna ask you to unmute there we go, there we go. okay hi this is um so sorry peter this is a difficult question but how much does legislation get in the way with climate change do you think and I just want to say one example. I live in Naivasha and we have geothermal power and they used to capture the sulfur dioxide from the air and we weren't allowed to use the, the uh, what do you call it, the leachate for farming, but it would have been very beneficial for farming. It was all tested, but because of the legislation, we weren't allowed to reuse it. What, how much do you think legislation gets in the way with climate change? Yeah, there's another tricky question, Ruth. I really can't give an authoritative answer on that, but you know, it depends on self-interest and money. If there's self-interest and money involved in that legislation, you're not going to get it through. We've seen that everywhere. It even little local developments in Cape Town where there's a building development going on which is going to disrupt the flow of a river and interrupt, you know, the ecology and the and the human impact is going to be enormous. It just goes ahead. Because these guys, and I don't want to, I might get myself into trouble here, but it seems like the fact that they're going to build a road has trumped all the other considerations because it's going to create huge economic and employment opportunities and access. And so legislation very often says, what's the financial benefit without asking what are the externalities, what are the long-term negative effects? And again, we need holistic environmental scientists that are there looking over the shoulder of the lawmakers. And I think that's the only way to keep them in check. Thank you. Good answer. And 
agriculturalist. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. And while I'm on the while I've still got the microphone, <laughs> I want to ask Liesl van Us. I've never met Liesl, but please can you make me some lamb breedy with speck boom in it? <laughs> I'm sorry for the vegetarians. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. And thank you, Liesl, uh, for uh, tongue in cheek there. Brilliant. Um, if there aren't any other questions, Chris, I know the room is still full. Uh, we have been going on for quite a while. It might be a good time to say a very thank you, a very much thank you to Dr. Johnson um, and his whole team from the UCT and all the collaborative science that's been happening to make his presentation um, possible and wonderful and good to listen. There we go. Peter Johnson. What a presentation. I, um, I really think highly, highly, highly informative, highly professional. Very little one can add um, with your, your knowledge base. It's incredible. Thank you. I hope that the heat will turn up so that a cumulative effect will happen that we move quicker and faster. And I think the cumulative effect, there's hope and it does happen through education and many other ways. But there's a cumulative effect needed. I always ask myself, how is it that the world overnight, if I can say overnight, became aware of the harm that is done through smoking and suddenly the world changed and said, we do it differently. And there was a cumulative a multiplier that happened there. I'm uncertain what it is. There's some theories, but I hope for that. Anyway, we need people like you, because that's the multiplying effect. I think in total, we were the highest number tonight. We were 120 people on. And if 120 people talk to each 10 others, the multiplier effect and the cumulative effect start happening. But the voices of yours, like yours, should not go quiet. Thank you very much for a very, very professional talk. Thanks to Ron for handling it all. I was in a bit of a situation where I could not have my sound on all the time. I'm not in South Africa at the moment, and uh, I'm right in the, in the in handling it all behind the scenes. And for everybody who came in, uh, you are also part of that multiplier effect. Thanks to everyone. Peter, uh, I wish for you a good night's rest. Maybe a nice glass of red wine now. Relax. Job Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks to everybody. Pleasure being here.